Can you talk a little bit about the opera Omi, which uh, to me was really important and an important period in salsa in the early 70s, and I think it created a completely different way to listen to this music and to understand it in a completely different venue at Carnegie Hall. Yeah, well, Latin music had never been in a concert venue before. It, this is before Yankee Stadium, so it, we were confined to dance halls, to social clubs, to schools, to, uh, you know, those kind of venues, you know, where you can dance. And um, I had, and I, I listened to the, the Who's Tommy, and mm -hmm. the, the Who were a very creative group, and they did this first rock opera. They called it a rock opera, but really what it was, it was a concept album. It was an album that told a story from beginning to end. In other words, one song led into the next song with a little narration in the middle, and the whole album told a story. So there were 10 or 15 songs that were related to each other one way along the line. I said, what a great idea. Like, let's do that in Latin music. So they had a deaf and dumb and blind boy that played a pinball machine. So I said, let me make a deaf and dumb and blind boy that plays the conga drum. So I stole a couple of ideas here and there. The other songs are really, uh, there's no plagiarism on the songs, but the idea of a deaf and dumb and blind person was actually the Who's idea. And I called Henny Alvarez and I, and we sat down and we mapped this thing out with interludes in the middle, mm -hmm. with a little narration. With And then I wrote all this classical kind of yellow Beatles, yellow submarine kind mm -hmm. of background music to these narrations. And then recorded it piece by piece by piece, and then I had free reign in the studio, and then just chopped it all up and put it all together and made what we called a for the first Latin opera, the first And concept. it had great reviews in the press at the time. Well, it, we, we did it in Carnegie Hall on a Thursday night. That was the only night we could get in Carnegie Hall, which at that time, which I thought was a very huge venue, it held 2,500 people. And we did two shows and sold out both shows, but we gave away free albums, so yeah. we never really made any money <laughs> because we were giving out free records and the record company took off the $5 for the album. On the top, and the top ticket was seven dollars at that time, so we right. never really made a dollar. But it, it, what it did, it, it brought Celia Cruz back into the fold of. I mean, she had moved to Mexico and was kind of like doing novellas and you know, kind of semi-retired. She didn't want to come back to the states and sing tropical music. And when I sent her this copy of this one song that I wrote for her, she came back to New York and, and in one take, I mean, just so marvelous that every hair of my body stood up and gave me chills all over and sang this one song called Gracia Divina, which really made set the whole album on fire. And um, she played the part of a groupie of this divine grace that, 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 that came along. And with that performance and, and, and Jerry Masucci being there, she signed with Fani Records, which kind of rekindled her career again and put her back on the map. And then eventually she moved back to the States. And, uh, started singing salsa again. And and those were really the, the heyday. That was the heyday of salsa. That was that right smack dab in the middle of the seventies. It sure was. And what it did then then once she performed with the funny all stars and we and we did the tour to Africa and we did a big South American tour, European tour, a Japanese tour and uh, we were like the Rolling Stones of Latin music. I mean they were ripping <laughs> our clothes off wherever we went. And we started making a couple of dollars and, and the music just exploded, it just expanded worldwide and, and here we were Japanese people singing in Spanish. And, and one of the things amazing. that I don't think a lot of people know about is how popular salsa was in Japan and in Europe and Africa, which I think is really interesting, very different um, yes. um, venues, very different yes. um, areas right. of well, the world. But don't forget, all the music, all Latin music came from Africa in the first place. Right. They just didn't realize it, <laughs> you know. And when we went there, and the, uh, even in Japan, the, the Japanese people may not have understood what we were talking about, but they could sing the songs phonetically. And, and, uh, and were they following you when you were there? Well, like well, let me give you an example. The first time I went to Japan it was in 1976 or 5, and they were very formal and, and very polite, and we'd finish <laughs> a song every way to go. <laughs> And they applaud like this. And <laughs> two years later, after the films came out, we went back again. And here now, all of a sudden, all these little girls are dancing on the table with mini faldas, you know, and dancing and jumping around and knowing the lyrics to the songs. And, and, you know, all of a sudden they have purple hair and green hair and orange hair and makeup. And they became salseros. And, and they took Latin dance lessons. And they, all of a sudden all these bands were springing up, uh, you know, Orquesta La Luz and Orquesta Sakamoto. Right. And, and, and they're great musicians, and 
I've been to Japan ten times, and there are many, many venues. I believe the next, really, the next big market for Latin music is in China. Oh, so I think that's, that's going to be interesting. the next one. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the Rumble in the Jungle concert? <laughs> Foreman and Ali um, fight. I, that must have been yes. quite an well, experience. This is 1974, and we had just come off the, the Yankee Stadium show, and, and all, all these marvelous things were happening to us. And, Muhammad Ali was fighting George Foreman, and they said, listen, we're going to put together a, an all-star weekend with 300 some odd musicians. So they took James Brown and B.B. King, right. Sister Sledge, the Pointer Sisters, the Funny All-Stars, uh, Lloyd Price, Hugh Masekela, uh, Big Black, wow. uh, Fela. I mean, they were, they were Fela, who I found out much later on, who's like a huge star in Africa. And I didn't know, I was producing all this stuff, and, and I didn't even know the names of these people, so I would write, the band with the green feathers, or the, <laughs> grand in, the band in the purple leather, or, you know, because I didn't know the names of these bands, I didn't know what they meant. And then when I found out who Fela was, I mean, Fela was like James Brown, or Fela was like Bob Marley of Africa, and he was such a wonderful man, into the politics of his country, too. Um, anyway, we are, here we are, so we fly, 18 hours all the way across the Atlantic into Spain and then down from Spain and we arrive in, in Africa and we arrive in Kinshasa at about 4.30 in the morning and there were 200 Watusis on the tarmac with the bones in their nose and grass skirts and big spears. Umbalaga, umbalaga, umbalaga. And it must have been is, amazing. This was Don King's first promotion too, <laughs> the first time he ever promoted a fight. So Don King was waiting at the bottom of the steps, and he goes, Welcome to the homeland, brother. Welcome to the homeland, with his hair sticking straight up in the air. And Mr. Mobutu came to greet us at the airport, the president of Zaire, with all his troops and his fanatics. And it became a very historic event. Yes. But we, I think this is all the time we have. I'm very oh, my goodness. glad that you were able Boston, to make it. it was Cambridge. Great. I love you, you, Cambridge. Very much. And you have to come tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. Love you all. Bye bye. Adios.